welcome you here to the Straight Lane Church of Christ, and we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your evening. We ask that as we join together in this worship service, that it will be edifying and uplifting to your spirit and to uh, gather a better sense of who God is, what he desires of our hearts, and what he desires for our lives. So join with me as we stand and we sing, sing praises. Why? Because we love the Lord. Sing, sing, come on and sing. Heavenly kind Father, we thank thee for this day. Father, we thank thee for preserving us. Father, we thank you for putting your loving arms around all of us. Father, we pray that we, as a, as a people, as a country, as a city, and as a nation, come together and learn to live in peace and harmony. Father, continue to pray that we, as a congregation, stay together. Communicate with one another and continue to love.
love one another. Father, we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, we welcome you to the Strayer Lane Church, and we ask you to continue in song with us as we sing our next selection, How Great is Our God. How Great is Our God. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, all will see how great, how great is our God. Over 
Good evening, family. This is a collection time, and uh, all of us have been given talents, and all of us have been given blessings. So it's time for us to look at giving some of those talents back to our Lord. And there are many ways that we have set up for you to do that. We have uh, Dropbox, we have Electronic, we have, uh, you can also give it back through the website. You can find that on the website as well. So it's, it's up to you within your heart how you want to do that. And we encourage you to do that as well, any way you can. Let's bow, please. Most graciously, Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before you and thank you so much for all that you have done for us, all the many rich blessings that you have done for us. During this time of confusion, dear Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless us in all the many ways that you have done so. And we pray that we will continue to receive those blessings from you and just be with us in all the ways that you have in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As well as our communion, dear Lord, we know it's been a while since you've been with us, but as you can remember, it's behind us it says, do this in remembrance of me. There's two scriptures that come to mind, the 26th chapter of the book of Matthews and the first Corinthians, the 11th chapter. There's two instruments bread and the uh, communion uh, that the bread of the blood of the Lord that he has instructed us to remember on the first day of the week that we are to use this as instruments that to uh, participate in to <clears throat> remember him and that's what we should always do uh, every week to remember him in commemoration of his death, burial, and resurrection. And with that in mind, let's go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, I'd like to thank you, dear Lord, for these two instruments. I'd like to thank you for your darling son who has given us this example of how he has death, burial, and resurrection for example of us, how we should always look to him as the author and finisher of our faith. Keep us forever in our prayers and that we will always look to you as the author and finisher of our faith. In Christ's name. Wait for the morning. 
Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem, redeem, redeem Israel from all their sins. As we prepare for the message on tonight given to us by our minister, Brother Robert Garden, I ask you to stand to your feet as we sing, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Join with me. My hope, hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Text 
the messages on Facebook and other means through which you contact us, that you are appreciative of the work that this group is doing as well. Tonight, our technology team consists of uh, two men who are diligent in their service as well, and we want to just let you know how much we appreciate you for that which you do. I see Brother Barry, I believe Brother Segovia is there, and also Brother Thomas Gill, Jr. Their work and that of those men who serve from time to time is exemplary, and it is quite a commitment on their part to have done so. The passage that comes to us tonight from the 130th Psalm is believed to have been written by David during the time of his onslaughts that were brought on by Saul as Saul sought to persecute him. Saul's jealousy and anger had become issues and David fled for his safety, for his well-being, and even for his life. This passage is one that I want us to keep in mind tonight because it appears at times in our minds that hope is on trial. Before talking about that extensively, I want to ask you to be mindful of Sister Hattie, Hattie Burns, Sister Hattie Burns, who is ill and uh, as of two days ago was still hospitalized and her family as they make careful decisions regarding her well-being. Sister Emma Luton as well, who is in hospice at this time. I want to ask you to pray for our minister emeritus and Sister Jones, Brother David Jones Jr.'s sister, his baby sister, passed away. We want you to remember them in the loss of Sister Betty Hillen. And we also want you to remember our two newest members of the congregation and our third newest member as well. On Thursday, Michael Watson and Ashton Hood were baptized into the body of Christ. And then just a few days earlier than that, Rita Robinson was baptized into the body of Christ and we had two members to come to this congregation who placed membership, and that is the Huffs, Andrew and Cheryl Huff. Keep all of them in your prayers. They, like the rest of us, have the challenges of looking for hope. As we look at the news, we see that hope sometimes is questionable. The coronavirus has caused many to be in a state where there is an absence or at least a depletion of hope. The civil injustices and the perpetual nature of those injustices have caused some, especially who are oppressed, to believe that after centuries and, and decades, laws passed and events that have been designed to cause things to get better, there are those who believe that there is no hope. So it seems at times that hope is on trial. In many of our lives, as we face the circumstances of life, whether it is illness, financial woes, relationship problems, or an unending list of other maladies that are consistent with the human experience, we may conclude that hope is waning, that it is dissipating, and therefore I say that hope is on trial. The passage, the 130th Psalm, while David was fleeing, David was able to think and to write this beautiful psalm 
that says to us that David was hoping and waiting. Shall I read it? Out of the depths have I cried unto the Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest make iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, I should say, who shall stand? That's the psalm is saying, God, if you recognize and if you hold and if you hold me accountable for my sins, my iniquities, who shall stand? The Roman writer says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then he says in verse 4, but I always like it, Brother Mason, when I come to a place in the scripture after describing the inequities, the vicissitudes, as Dr. Jones would call them, the hardships, the trials, the troubles, that somewhere along the way there is but. So David says, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. And then David begins to describe to us his reality regarding weight. David says, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. If you've ever been ill at night, if you've ever been troubled at night, if you've ever experienced what it's like to be upset and anxious at night, you long for, you wait for anxiously the dawn, the daylight to come. And David here says that my soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that wait for the morning. I say more than they that wait and watch for the morning. So in this passage, David begins to speak. Now, if, in fact, hope is on trial, then I'm here this afternoon to call witnesses to persuade us that hope is, in fact, although on trial, alive and well. David, I want to call David as my first witness. In this psalm, David has said it well in verses 4, 5, and 6. After saying there is forgiveness, David says, I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait for thee. And then he says, not only do I wait, but he says, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. David is hope on trial. And here's what David has said in this small work. He has used two words that we see in this passage that are very much akin, and we'll see more of that. David says, I wait, I wait, and not just waiting aimlessly, but David says, I wait for the Lord. But also, David says, I hope. And I looked at these two words from the original language from which this was written. And the first word, wait, quava, as it's pronounced in the original language, has to do with the patient waiting. It's that waiting patiently and tarrying. You know, David's witness is saying to us that hope is well and hope is alive but hope requires us to wait patiently. There are those of us today who perhaps have come to the conclusion that all the debacles and all the obstacles that we face right now, we shall never overcome. But David says, I am to wait patiently. And although David was under the siege of Saul, David, although he was running, although he was hiding in caves, being looked for by 400 men, K 
capable soldiers, David said, I wait for the Lord. But here, not only does David say, I wait for the Lord, but he, he elevates that by saying this word, yacha, in the original language. He uses the term hope. You see, there is a little difference between waiting and hoping. And when I looked at the original language, what it said to me was that this word, hope, is I am waiting, but I am waiting because, because. See, David already knew what God could do. So as we wait, David gives us a testimony that says, hope is a patient expectation because. You see, that's why David could write his most familiar, that is the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He can say those kinds of things, and he can conclude by saying, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David could say that. David could wait patiently. David could have hope because. So, David, thank you for your testimony. I would like now, if you would allow me, to call the Apostle Paul to witness before us. The Apostle Paul was one who had wonderful accounts of what God had done and what God could do. David, his testimony is quite simple in a way, rather Paul's testimony, because he says in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 that we have this hope that is an anchor of the soul. Now, in these times, when some would place hope on trial, the question is not, is hope on trial? The question is, better stated, do you have hope for your soul? You see, I, I can have hope for my physical well-being. I can have hope for my financial well-being. I can even have hope for my emotional togetherness. But the question is, what about hope for the soul? Many today are going off on tangents that are dangerous, corrupt, sinful, harmful to others. Why? Because they have not realized that there is hope for the soul. Do you ever feel untogether? I occasionally, Brother Curry, I'm, I'm a positive, optimistic person, but occasionally I'll have this feeling that says, I feel a little undone. I feel somewhat unsettled. And that usually comes when the tasks are mounting faster than I'm able to address them. And when those things that oppose what I want to do as a leader and what we should be doing as a church begin to become obnoxious. They begin to become compelling. And I feel a little undone. And that's when I have to call on the testimony of Paul who says, hope is an anchor not just for your emotions, not for your finances, not just for your finance, not. Hope is an anchor of a soul. And you and I need a soul. And when Paul said that in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, he said it with such conviction by saying it these, this way. We have this hope as an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast. Now, I want you to know 
that perhaps there was no one more capable than Saul of this testimony in which he styled hope as an anchor of the soul. In the 27th chapter of the writing of Acts, he knew something about anchors. It was here that Paul was in an experience that caused him ultimately to be shipwrecked. And when you read from Acts chapter 27, and particularly verse 20, it says this, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope, note that word, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. You see, Paul had been put on a ship, and it was at a time when somewhat like our, our uh, weather, when we have the storms that come out of the tropics, that this area in the Mediterranean was known for tropical storms. It was not a fair time for sailing. But the captain of the ship and those who had placed him on the ship decided that the winds were coming softly from the south and that it would be safe to sail. But verse 20 here tells us that as they began to sail, verse 14 says, not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind, a storm, if you will, a tempest. Christ knew about tempest, but Paul did also. And Paul says, we didn't see the sun, we didn't see the stars for many days, that's because of this great storm. All they saw was water, and they were tossed. And Paul says it seemed as though all hope was lost. He describes that, but when we get to verse 29, the Bible says, well, I'll start with verse 27. But when the 14th night was come, can you imagine that? 14 nights on a roaring sea. When the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in the Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some land. And they sounded, and they found it 20 phantoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 phantoms. And what this is describing is that they were using their sounding techniques and the echoes were telling them that they were getting closer to land. They were at first about 120 feet deep when they sounded. And when they sounded the second time, it was about 90 feet deep. And then the Bible says, verse 29, then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast not one anchor, not two anchors, not three anchors, but they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. You see, Paul knew about this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, I was shipwrecked three times. He knew about anchors, and Paul uses that experience to talk about hope, and although it seemed that all hope was lost on this ship, he comes along later and he says that hope is the anchor of the soul. Paul, thank you. I appreciate your testimony that says, in hope, we have an anchor of the soul, steadfast and sure. Let's call upon Paul because Paul also said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, as he was teaching the Christians at Corinth regarding God's word, regarding Christianity, regarding Christ coming, regarding the fact that we have hope because of the resurrection. That was his central topic at that point in his message. Paul gave the resurrection message to tell us about the fact that we have hope that is eternal. Paul's testimony is not only that we have hope as an anchor of the soul, but Paul says we have hope and hope is eternal. Paul said it this way, if in this life only we have hope, then we of all men 
are most miserable. In the NIV, it says, we are to be pitied more than all men if we have hope only in this life. Those of you today who sit in the courtroom of God's word and you question hope and whether it is advisable and wise and realistic to have hope, hope may be on trial in your mind, but what Paul points out is that we have hope for this life and we have hope for eternity. Thank you, Paul. For your testimony. And then there's Isaiah. Isaiah comes to us with testimony and you're familiar with his words. We often quote them from the 40th chapter of Isaiah verse 31. It's where Isaiah said, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. In the NIV the Bible says, they that hope for the Lord shall renew their strength. These two words are, are very much akin in their meaning and their connotation and their use. Isaiah knew about hope. Now, what I did not want to do in this court and this discussion of wisdom being on trial is to bring something in here that someone could throw out as hearsay evidence. Hearsay evidence is not admissible. So as a result of that, I was questioning how Isaiah would have the first-hand knowledge to know that hope renews strength. And all I had to do was go back and read Isaiah's experience in the 38th chapter where the Bible was dealing and God had a message through Isaiah to give to Hezekiah. Turn with me there for just a moment. In the 38th chapter, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, what did he say, Isaiah? Thus saith the Lord, Set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Isaiah is coming here tonight to testify, and he is not testifying as a hearsay witness. Hearsay evidence is not acceptable. He is telling us what he has seen firsthand. What happened, Isaiah? Well, Isaiah says, I went to Hezekiah. And I told him that the Lord said, Hezekiah, put your house in order because you will not live. And then the Bible says in verse 2, Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. And allow me to say to those of us who would ever put on trial hope, Start by praying to the Lord just as high Hezekiah did. And the Bible says, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, prayed to the Lord, and he said this, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked walk before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. You see, I like what Hezekiah had to say. Hezekiah said, I have just heard from the man of God that my days are numbered, put my house in order, I'm going to die. Hezekiah turns to the wall, prays to God, and says, God, but I want you to remember one thing. I want you to remember that I have been obedient to you. I have walked before you in truth with a perfect heart, and I have done that which is good in thy sight. So, thank you very much. So, as a result of that, here's what happened. And again, I'm telling you and myself that Isaiah, when he says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, and that hope renews strength, He's not talking about something that he heard. He's talking about what he saw. He's an eyewitness. 
And the Bible tells us, Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, The God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add to thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Isaiah, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your firsthand account. Thank you for your eyewitness account that hope renews strength. He saw hope take a man from his virtual deathbed to 15 years of life and quality life. And there are those of you in this courtroom tonight in which we are assembled who would question hope, who like former President Barack Obama would talk about the audacity of hope. I want you to know that we have the audacity of hope. We have the courageousness to believe because hope does what otherwise we would not believe could be done. Hope is bold, and I tell you that this witness, Isaiah, gives us reason for hope. Well, before we leave this, I want to call upon one more witness. And that witness is no less than Solomon. Solomon, the wise one. Excuse me. Solomon was wise, and in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 7 through 15, we get a great insight into what it was that makes him such a good witness for hope today. You see, when Solomon came to the throne, he was, in his own words, like a little child. Now, what Solomon would say as we have summoned him as a witness is recorded in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 4 through 10. And what he says there is, hope is the blessing of living while we're living. Let me say that again. Hope is the blessing of living while we're living. He says, enjoy your life. When you work, work hard. But when you eat, eat well. Enjoy the wife of your youth. He said, while you are living, live. The circumstances around us today could be so overwhelming that we overlook the life that we're living. We overlook the blessings that God is giving. So this witness, Solomon, who in our vernacular we would say had it good, says hope is the blessing of living life while we're living. Specifically, in verse 4 of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, he said it this way. For to him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. He went on to write, and he said, I would rather be a living dog than a dead lion. That's Solomon, his wisdom. Clever, cunning, funny perhaps. But you know what that's saying to me? And I want to challenge you. As long as you have life and breath, know assuredly that you have hope. Your child may be having a difficult time, health-wise, emotionally, or in other ways, but that child has hope and you have hope. Your aging parent may be suffering the loss of cognitive skills, the loss of memory, 
the inability to physically move about as he or she did in the past. But always, as Solomon reminds us in his testimony, for to him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. You may be in a job situation that causes you to wake up every morning with a headache just for the thought of going in there. It's a bad situation. The people there may be disrespectful. They may even be oppressive. I don't know. But as long as you are living, there's hope. You may be in a circumstance where sin has just overwhelmed you. And I want to advise you. I want to encourage you. I want to suggest to you. I want to challenge you to acknowledge that sin. But not only do I suggest to you that you acknowledge sin, but know in your heart, as long as God has spared and given you life, just as David talked about in the 130th Psalm when he says that, that God marks our iniquities, he doesn't mark them. God will forgive you if you will obey him. If you will obey him. So Solomon says, hope is the blessing of the living while we are living. I'm always reminded of one of my favorite passages from Philippians chapter 4 that says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtues, if there be any praise, think on these things. What was the Apostle Paul saying there? Paul was saying, as long as you are living, as long as you can think positively, as long as you can find the right direction, there's hope. Think on these things. Those of you tonight, under the sound of my voice, who may be not only oppressed but depressed because of the calamities that you face, because of the unrest and injustices and the mountain-like hurdles that lie before you in your personal life, I want to say to you that there's hope. Yes, We've had these witnesses to come before us tonight. David, the Apostle Paul, Solomon in his wisdom, and Isaiah. And they have all testified, but they're not the only ones. Were we to go to the Faith Hall of Fame, the writing of Hebrews, we would find that Moses was faithful. Why was Moses faithful? Because he had hope. We would find that the people of God, the prophets, were sawn asunder. They prophesied. Why? Because they had hope in God. So I say to you tonight that these witnesses tell us that hope Although some would say it's on trial, that hope is alive and hope is well. Yes, there's Hannah. Hannah prayed before God. And I always love the account of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, because the Bible tells us that every year when they went, to the time to offer sacrifice, the same things would happen. Hannah would be mocked by her sister wife, if you will, Panina, because Hannah was barren. The Bible says that God had shut up her womb. And the Bible tells us that this time that Hannah, after the supper, prayed. And she prayed earnestly, and her mouth moved. And Eli thought that because she was praying and her mouth was moving, that perhaps she was drunken. But she wasn't drunken. She was praying to God. And she prayed because she 
had hope. First Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. And she replied that, no, I'm not drunk. And I'm praying because I'm asking God to give me a son, to give me a child. And if God gives me a child, I will dedicate that child. I will give that child back to him. And when her child was born, when she conceived, Although her husband was old, she conceived and she gave birth to a child and she praised God because she realized that her hope in the Lord had come through. One thing about hope, she said that God would guard her feet. Those were her words. Why did she say that? And why should you and I today have hope for God to guard our feet? Well, I'm just telling you to hang on. I'm telling you to always have hope because, you see, Hannah went through this, follow with me, year after year, after perplexing year, after agonizing year, after Panina continuing to have children, year. After her husband getting old, year. After her praying, years. I'm saying that she realized and she believed and she had hope in spite of all of that. And God guarded her feet. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. He will guard the feet of his saints. So we've heard these witnesses tonight. Do you have hope? Do you have hope in the Lord? I encourage you to have hope in the Lord. David in the 130th Psalm says, I have hope in the Lord because, you remember that? David said, because of his word. His word as Brother Mason so eloquently said today, is true. And because his word is true, you and I have hope. What's true about his word? It's true that Christ came to the world because we were lost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. I believe that, and because God has given his son, we have hope. I believe that we have hope because God is not willing for us to perish. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I have hope. I have hope because God has given us the plan of salvation. Hear the gospel of Christ. Believe it with all your heart. Repent of your sins. Confess your belief in Christ and be baptized tonight for the remission of your sins. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the apostle said, And this promise that was spoken on the day of Pentecost is not only to you, not just to those who were there on the day of Pentecost, but to those who are far off. That's us. I have hope because as Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, and now we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, those who are called according to his purpose. Do you love the Lord? Are you called according to his purpose? Will you come to the Lord hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized? You can do that tonight. Our prayer line is now accessible to you. You can email us at prayer underscore request at schraderlane.org. Or you can call 712-775-7465. Our elders are waiting and they will assist you. And by all means, whether you call that line or send that email tonight, have hope. May God be with you until we meet again. I rest my case.
though we are undergoing this pandemic, we are still uh, fighting. And we'll continue to do things that are pleasing them today. Brother God and Howe and Brother Nixon, we would like to thank both of you all today. May we go to God in prayer. Our Lord and Savior, we thank you for this day. Father, we pray that for those who are sick and shut in. Father, we pray for those who love God. Father, we pray for those of us who have hope. Hope will help all of us. Even though we are going through a trial at this time, but as Brother John Howard says, we have hope. This we have now. Christ. Amen. 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 Come. Thank you. 